Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the fifth element in the periodic table, boron. I have a sample of boron right here in this glass vial. This is the brown form of boron. It's a little maybe hard to see, so let's take a look at it a little bit closer. I put it on my scanner for you. This is, uh, again, the amorphous form of boron. We'll discuss that a little bit more later. Let's take a look at it a little bit closer. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. As I mentioned, boron is the fifth element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is five because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that's what distinguishes it as a unique element. It's also a historical element. A true Renaissance man way before the Renaissance was Jabir ibn Hayyan, whose work contains the oldest known systematic classification of chemical substances. He mentioned the mineral borax, a source of boron in his writings. He's a fascinating individual. I encourage you to look up more information on him. More on borax in a bit. Boron was isolated by Sir Humphrey Davy, Joseph Louis Gay Lussac, and Louis Jacques Thenard in 1808. I usually talk about the mineralogy here, but I'm going to come back to that later in the video. Pure boron metal was first produced by American chemist Ezekiel Weintraub in 1909. There wasn't enough time during the Big Bang to create elements such as boron, aside from trace amounts. Also, boron is not created as a result of nucleosynthesis, or the building up of elements inside stars by the fusion process. Some boron is made in dying massive stars, or supernovae, but much of the boron present today is created between the stars from atoms that make up the interstellar medium. The process, called spallation, involves extremely fast-moving particles called cosmic rays. They can crash into larger atoms, such as carbon, and break them into smaller pieces. This also creates boron atoms on Earth by cosmic rays interacting with atoms of oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere. Even though boron is the fifth element in the table, it's still pretty rare, coming in as the 64th most abundant element in the universe by mass, only one part per billion. Twice as abundant in the sun, it's the 56th most abundant element at two parts per billion. It's the 36th most abundant element in meteorites, much more common, at 1.6 parts per million. The crust of the Earth is a virtual treasure house of elements. Boron is the 38th most common element at 8.6 parts per million, four times as common as tin. Compared with many other elements, boron is the 11th most common element in the ocean, but when you throw in all that water, it's still very dilute and only makes up 4.4 parts per million. And lastly, Surprisingly, there's a bit of boron in us, probably absorbed from the plants we eat. Plants use boron in their cell walls. We only have uh, 7 parts per 10 million, or about 18 milligrams in us. This amount is not considered hazardous, and it serves no known human biological function. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same five protons for boron, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 16 known isotopes of boron, and of those 16, there are only two stable, non-radioactive isotopes, boron-10 and boron-11. 
There's far more boron-11 than boron-10 in the universe, as you see here. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of boron occupy the same place in the periodic table. There are no long-lived radioactive isotopes of boron. As a matter of fact, the longest-lived is boron-8, with a half-life of only 772 milliseconds, less than one second. More on half-life in the next slide. Some of the half-lives are measured in time units most people have never heard of. Aside from the MS, which stands for milliseconds or thousandths of a second, we also see a time unit with a ZS and another time unit with a YS. You've probably heard the term millisecond, but what about the other two? The ZS stands for zeptoseconds. A zeptosecond is a billionth of a trillionth of a second, 10 to the minus 21 seconds. And YS stands for yoctoseconds, a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. 10 to the minus 24th seconds. Light, moving at 300,000 kilometers per second, cannot travel across even a thousandth of the diameter of an atom in a yoctosecond. If we compare the size of the boron atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. Boron is just a bit bigger than hydrogen, by about 64%. Notice the three electrons in the outer shell. There's still room for an additional five. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are mind-bogglingly small. Here, our atom size is sorted from largest, cesium, on the top left, to smallest, helium, on the bottom right. Boron is the tenth smallest atom, mainly because of its simplicity. Notice that many of the early elements in the periodic table are found in the lower right of this chart, except maybe for the alkali metals all of which have large atoms. Boron is very light. Its density is only 2.08 grams per cubic centimeter, about double that of water at one gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up a few more elemental densities so you can compare. Note that boron falls between the densities of magnesium and aluminum. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, boron's density is 2.08 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle, slightly below the density of aluminum. Boron is really hard stuff, coming in at 9.3 on Mohs scale of hardness. You won't be surprised to learn that this scale was invented by a German geologist and mineralogist, Frederick Mohs, in 1812. Interestingly, there are two forms of boron nitride, both chemically identical but structurally different. Hexagonal boron nitride has a structure similar to graphite, forming sheets. Like graphite, this form is also soft, with a hardness of 2. Rearrange those atoms into a cubic structure, and you get boron nitride that's even harder than pure boron, with a hardness very close to diamond. Related closely to its hardness is its springiness, and boron is really stiff, springy stuff. Sound, therefore, moves through boron really fast. It's the second and next fastest element after carbon in the form of diamond. Sound moves through boron at an astonishing 16.2 kilometers per second, over 47 times as fast as sound moves through air. Not only can you build different forms of boron nitride structurally, you can do the same with pure boron. 
These different structures are called allotropes. They're all pure boron, but with different atomic arrangements and different physical qualities. On the left, you see an amorphous form of boron that appears as a brown powder. On the right, a more crystalline form that appears metallic. Both are pure boron. Boron metal goes for between $150 and $300 per kilogram, as far as I can tell. Of course, the price depends on the quantity you buy and its purity. Because of its low density, you get a lot of boron volume-wise for its weight. If I wanted to add boron to my set of density cubes, it would cost me between $65 and $130 for a new cube, but it's so close to the density of aluminum there's really no point, and given its hardness, machining it would be very, very difficult. Boron does not occur on the Earth in its metallic form. It's always combined with other elements, mainly oxygen. The oxygen compounds are called borates. For instance, this is kernite, a hydrated sodium borate hydroxide mineral discovered in 1926 in eastern Kern County in Southern California, where it gets its name from. Borax, also referred to as sodium borate or tin cow, is a hydrated or anhydrous borate of sodium. Note that most of these borates are water-soluble. Even though boron is pretty rare in the crust of the earth, where water has gathered and then evaporated, the borates concentrate in what are called evaporites. Death Valley is one such place where you find borate evaporites. Ulexite is a hydrated sodium calcium borate hydroxide. It occurs as a silky white rounded crystalline mass, or sometimes in parallel fibers that can transmit light just like fiber optics, although the piece on the right has undoubtedly been carved for artistic reasons into a tower appearance. If I magnify it, you can clearly see the parallel crystals that act like fiber optics. Ulexite is sometimes known as TV rock or television stone. If you took a slice of the crystal from the previous slide and polished the ends, light coming through the crystal fibers would transmit the image from the bottom surface of the stone to the top surface. It's a bit hard to see here in a flat two-dimensional video, but it's obvious in person. Get a piece of Ulexite online and try that for yourself. You can visit some of the places where you'll find these evaporites. One is even called boron. Boron is located in Kern County, California. No surprise there. Very close to one of the largest boron mines in the country, the Rio Tinto mine. Here's a ground view. This open pit mine is three or four miles across. Historically, borax was first mined in Death Valley and hauled out by the famous 20 mule teams. Actually, they were 18 mules and two horses. They traveled 160 miles pulling nine tons of borax and enough food and water to make the trip. Check out the Wikipedia page on the 20 mule team. It's quite a history and support Wikipedia. Those mules became a symbol of the product. Borax is used in household laundry and cleaning products and in Boraxo hand soap. I've read where it may be used in some tooth bleaching products, but I'd avoid these because borax can have adverse reactions if swallowed. Also, I don't know if I'd use it to bathe my apparent triplets in. Sodium perborate serves as a source of active oxygen in many laundry detergents, cleaning products, and laundry bleaches. Borosilicate glass is typically 12 to 15 percent boron trioxide, about 80 percent silica or quartz, and about 2 percent aluminum oxide. Borosilicate glass has very low expansion rates when the temperature varies, meaning quick changes of temperature will not cause internal stresses that could cause the glass to shatter. 
you can quickly change the temperature by 300 degrees Fahrenheit without shattering. There are many brand names for this type of glass. Most people are familiar with Pyrex. Borosilicate glass is almost universally used in laboratory glassware as well. I previously mentioned boron nitride. It's an interesting molecule that has several molecular allotropes. It can form flat sheets with atoms arranged in hexagons, similar to graphite. It can arrange its atoms in a cubic form, much like diamond, or even a more three-dimensional hexagonal structure. Each has different physical properties, even though they all have the same chemical formula. Hexagonal boron nitride is useful as a higher temperature lubricant, where carbon graphite would burn up. Cubic boron nitride is very hard and useful as an abrasive, completely opposite uses. Its super hardness also makes it useful for making cutting tools used in machine shops. Closely related, boron carbide can be formed into extremely hard ceramic, 9.5 to 9.75 on Mohs scale. It's the third hardest substance known after boron nitride and diamond. The ceramic finds use in bulletproof vests and armor for military vehicles, also in the nuclear industry, which I'll discuss next. Boron, specifically the less common boron-10 isotope, is used in reactor cores to absorb neutrons. You can ignore the neutron cross-section label here and just know that elements near the top of the chart are good neutron absorbers and elements near the bottom are poor absorbers of neutrons. Boron is a good absorber and is used to control the fission reaction in the core of the reactor. The silvery fuel rod tubes here are made from the element zirconium, which is almost transparent to neutrons and allows them through from the fissioning uranium inside. Control rods containing boron are interspersed among the fuel rods. These control rods, well, control how fast the fissioning reactions take place because boron absorbs neutrons, preventing further fissioning of the uranium. Fission of the uranium atom happens when it's hit by a stray neutron. The extra neutron destabilizes the nucleus, which then splits into two smaller, lighter nuclei. The split, or fission, of the atom releases energy and several additional neutrons that are now free to cause more uranium atoms to fission. Since many neutrons are released by a single fissioning atom, and each neutron can cause a further uranium atom to fission, the reaction can grow exponentially, resulting in an uncontrolled release of energy. If you were developing a nuclear weapon, this is exactly what you want. In a nuclear reactor, it's the last thing you want. To control the fission reaction, you need to absorb a critical number of neutrons. As I mentioned, some elements, like boron, are very good neutron absorbers. In a nuclear reactor core, control rods containing these absorbing elements are interspersed among the uranium fuel rods. Pulling the control rods out of the core allows more neutron reactions to take place, heating up the core. Pushing the rods in slows the reaction, cooling the reactor. While boron compounds are about as toxic as table salt to mammals, it has a much higher toxicity to arthropods, such as insects. Boric acid is used as a roach powder and is great at getting rid of ants in the house when mixed into some apple juice. Gets the ants without affecting your pets. Still, though, keep your pets from drinking the bait. The boric acid is slow enough acting that the ants take it back to the nest, affecting the entire colony. Boron is responsible for the green color in some fireworks. You can do this one at home. No, wait, I'm supposed to say don't do this at home. In a flame-proof container on a heat-proof surface, don't mix some boric acid into denatured alcohol and don't light it on fire. If you did, you'd get green flames. 
And when you don't do this, keep an eye on things and have a fire extinguisher handy for safety. Also, don't try table salt for a bright yellow sodium flame. If you react boric acid with silicone oil, you might end up with a stretchy, bouncy material with several unique properties. That would, of course, be silly putty. Most people call these amazingly strong magnets neodymium magnets. They come in all shapes, sizes, strengths, and magnetic field arrangements. While they're generically referred to as neodymium magnets, they're really mostly iron, with boron in there too, about 82% iron, 12% neodymium, and 6% boron. Doesn't work without the boron. Combining the last two slides, if you infuse silly putty with iron particles, a nearby neodymium iron boron magnet becomes engulfed as you see in this time-lapse video. This kind of reminds me of the 1958 Steve McQueen movie, The Blob. Slime was a toy product manufactured by Mattel in 1976. It was sold in a plastic trash can. It consisted of a non-toxic, viscous, oozing green material made primarily from guar gum. The main components are polysaccharide guar gum and sodium tetraborate. You can make your own formula with a slight variation on ingredients. Use polyvinyl acetate or Elmer's glue, borax, and water mixed with a little bit of green food coloring to approximate the original slime formula. Your body does not use boron, but probably still contains about 18 milligrams absorbed from the plants you eat. It has no known biological function in mammals. However, in plants, boron is essential. It plays a key role in plants, including the formation of cell walls, adding stability and structural integrity. It's also employed in the movement of sugar or energy into the growing parts of the plant. As you can see, the plant on the left, given only a small amount of boron, is stunted in growth. Boron is an important additive to fertilizers. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about boron. Just doing your job, holding plant cells together. No fireworks, no fuss. In the next program in this series, we'll examine an element essential for life that also happens to be, if I may use an old Carol Channing song reference, a girl's best friend, carbon. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element boron. <laughs>